Thank you. Ooh, I'm on. That's good. Good to be here. I've met some of you women uh, at the e women's event six months ago. I want this. Ryan, will you make this? Oh, I got it. My Bible's real big. So the print can be big. Wow, what a challenging video. Um, I whispered over to Ryan, oh man, now I'm going to have to change some things. Uh, not because I, I, I'm, I'm on board with that totally and agree. It just wrecks me every time. And so I am thankful for the Holy Spirit who goes before us and Ryan planned this whole evening. Really, from the prayers that we prayed at the table, the video, uh, and what I know that the Holy Spirit has put on my heart to share with you. It just thrills me every time. What a privilege it is uh, to, to do this and to be here with you. And so I pray that after hearing Brad on Sunday, after hearing uh, that video, that the message that God has placed on my heart just not only challenges you, but I pray that it encourages you and empowers you through the Holy Spirit to find your place. Each of you, each of us has a place. Some of us, uh, the Murphys, myself, and some of you I don't yet know, um, we've had a number of places. So I, I just pray that that God would encourage your hearts tonight. If you do have your Bibles, uh, we'll be turning some places. If you don't, uh, just be along for the ride. You know, hand in hand. I've known uh, since I talked to Ryan about coming tonight that the theme would be hand in hand. And then as I walked up to the building and saw this, again, it hit me. And this, this image, and it's so funny that you showed that video. I didn't know you were going to show that that portion, but because I turned to my husband even before we saw the, the video and I said, oh, I just have this picture of us not like walking along hand in hand, but a picture of us in the body of Christ always reaching to bring someone along with us, that kind of hand in hand, not only holding the rope like Ryan would say, which I already, already am planning on talking about, but that we, no matter where we are on our journey with the Lord, that we would always be reaching to bring someone along with us. So as we think of hand in hand and as I speak tonight, I, I want you to keep that in mind because no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, if you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're a step ahead of someone who doesn't know him. And so let's keep that in our minds. You know, this in itself, the fact that I'm here tonight, the fact that uh, as a mobilizer with Africa Inland Mission, like Ryan was saying, and you representing the local church. This is an answer to prayer for us as our organization. In our breakthrough prayers this year, our prayer is already um, came out of Ryan's mouth tonight. The Holy Spirit is doing a work in our country, in our churches, in our organizations to bring us to this hand in hand. We, our breakthrough prayers at Africa Inland Mission are that we together with the church would be doing like that rope thing that it's and so this is an answer to prayer in and of itself and so i want you as the local church to pick your picture yourself again not just holding the rope but being in it now you are all in it each of us is part of the body of Christ, and each of us is part of the greater missions picture. So if you heard Brad Buser speak, you already know, um, and you already heard in a pretty radical way what missions is 
and why do missions? And, you know, I, but I still want to start with why do we do this missions thing anyway? And I have to say that if the Lord Jesus is the Lord of your life, then each of us should be about three things. It was, Jesus made it very clear and gave us very clear commands. Three of them are especially important in our lives for us to focus on. And we need to know what his will is in order to obey him. If we don't know what he's telling us to do, how can we obey him? Well, there's this great thing called the word of God. And guess what? It's not a mystery. When I first came to Christ, I, I, all I wanted to do was to know God's will and to, it, and to do it. And I struggled for so long to figure out, what is his will? What does he want from me? Guess what? It was here all the time. So I want to um, unpack. It's not a mystery. If you do have your Bibles, uh, turn to Matthew 22. Like I said, I searched for this mystery for a long time. I would, I've been in ministry for almost 20 years, or maybe 20 years. Uh, first in ministry at our church as the children's pastor, and then went uh, to the field. I'll talk about more about my missions journey in a minute, and a, a little bit of it. I'm glad you know some of it. But in Matthew 22, here's where Jesus tells us the most important commandment of all. I'll start in verse 34 of Matthew 22. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart. You know this by heart, I'm sure. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. I'll say it again. This is the first and greatest commandment. Guess how long it took me in ministry to figure this out? 19 years-ish. Actually, I think I learned it in, in 2021. Again, when I burn out, trying to do all the other things. You guys, this is the most, the first commandment. Then Jesus goes on to say, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Guess what? That means, well, we'll get to what it means. But that means that no matter what God asks you to do, to do, like to act out and to do with your time, that the most important thing is that you know him and love him. Because guess what? If you don't do that, the rest of it is burned up and doesn't even amount to anything. Jesus says, without him, you can do nothing. So the Great Commission, reaching the unreached, all that stuff that we're learning about, all that we want to do, it's trash, dirty rags. Know the Lord your God. So those are the first two. And then there was another one that he said before he ascended to heaven. And again, you've heard it a lot this week. The Great Commission. That's in Matthew 28. I would imagine a lot of you know that by heart too. And that was right before Jesus left his disciples. And do you know that while they were on that mountain and he was with his disciples, they're all around him, and they're on that mountain, do you know that there were still some among them who had seen his miracles, lived with him, walked with him, 
served with him in ministry and still doubted? It says that right before he says the Great Commission. We're all at different places on our journeys, guys. After that, some were doubting. They're on the, and he's about to go. And he says, this is the last thing he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them everything I've talked to you, I've taught you. And surely I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. What he was talking about was he was about to leave. And he was coming back. And we live in that age. And so you can know without a doubt, because you're going to, you love him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and, and all your strength. And you can know without a shadow of a doubt that no matter what he asks you to do for him, and no matter where you go, he'll be with you. I pray that you take that away uh, with you tonight, that truth. Because that's with the, you can't know the Great Commission and do the Great Commission with forgetting that. Many of us, this is a confession, true confession from a missionary. Many of us really get going on the obedience. And we fail to abide in such a way that keeps us healthy. You have to do these in this order. You have to abide with him. So please don't forget that. Please. So, the Great Commission. I, I want to challenge you with this, and you've already been challenged with this, but I, I think to myself, and I watch that video, and I ask myself this, you know, we go and we do a lot of things, myself included. But we need to be about making disciples. So um, a couple of you have already said tonight, be strategic. You know, whatever we're doing, because that's what the Great Commission is, right? So no, no matter what, whether we're here, there, um, among the nations, wherever we are, it needs to be connected to the making of disciples, even here. That's why you have a youth group. That's why you have a children's program. And then the Great Commission is when we go, go to the nations. I have another challenge. Uh, I've got so much that is on my heart tonight. I'm going to talk to you about that too. But as I challenged myself with that thought, and even today as I went over my notes again, I was thinking all of the things that go into making disciples. You know, sometimes it's praying, sometimes it's sending, sometimes it's becoming a disciple. Some of you in this room are in the process of becoming a disciple. That's part of it, isn't it? And I'll share that with part of my own story very briefly. Some of us are going. Some of us are literally training and discipling. And then some of us are helping to heal up those who have been going. They've gone to battle. They've gone to the hard places. And they need to be helped and, and ministered to so they can go back out. So there are many aspects of making disciples, but I will tell you that we always need to be strategic and be doing one of those, one of those things. So we have this great example in the Bible in someone who's gone before us, in Paul. You know, I, I was thinking that we had the privilege of going on a Footsteps of Paul tour in October. And we got to, uh, anyway, I, I would go way over if I told you about that trip. But one thing we were talking about, and we decided when we come back from that trip, we want to read all of Acts again. We want to read all the letters. We want to know more and more. And as if we hadn't learned enough, but we were hungry to know even more and more and more. And one thing that my husband really hit him recently is, you know what? Paul was on his way to Spain. 
this came to my mind when we were watching the video because David Platt mentioned that. He was on his way to Spain. You guys, did he make it? Anybody know? He never made it where God was calling him to go, you guys. Wow. That hit me again in that video. But, and I, I, this totally fits with what I wanted to leave you with tonight. Because although God had called Paul to go to Spain, he ended up in Romans and lost his head for the gospel in Rome. And he never made it to Spain. But walking everywhere along the way, Paul left transformation in his wake. Everywhere he went, walking, 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 shipwrecked, jailed, all that he went to, went through to get where God was calling him to go, the whole time, Paul was walking out his faith in obedience, and he's making disciples all along the way. That's what I want to leave you with tonight. Because you're somewhere on your journey, just like Paul was on a journey, never making it to where God called him to go. We're all on a journey, and we don't wait until we're missionaries to be about the Great Commission. We always need to be about making disciples. Some part of the picture in the body of Christ, some somehow holding the rope, somehow hand in hand reaching to bring someone along to heaven with you, reaching to bring someone along. That's what discipling is. You're reaching to bring someone, to teach them, to raise them up. You know, it makes me think of my own journey as I was reflecting on all of this, like, and thinking about Paul, I realized, you know, there, there was something about Paul, where I, like I was saying, I was just reading here, but in 1 Corinthians um, 9, 16, I'll just tell you what he says, because um, I'm short on time, but Paul says he, he can't boast about what he does because he's only doing what God compelled him to do. So he can't boast in that. He's only obeying what God was telling him to do. Oh, that my life would reflect that. That I'm, I, I'm only doing what God compelled me to do. And that in doing that and in obeying that, that I'm leaving this wake of transformation behind me. And I got to thinking about my own journey. And my journey didn't just like, boom, start with being a missionary. Ryan already mentioned it started with go, going, well, first of all, I'll tell you, it started when I was about 20 years old when I accepted Christ. When I accepted Christ, I wasn't ready. I needed to be discipled. So the first part of my story was that I grew. I was a new believer, and I grew at Claremont Emmanuel. I grew up in the Lord in knowing the word. So my first step was that I, I grew. That's part of it. And next, I was a part of training up. I was the children's pastor. I told you that. Um, during that same time, my late husband and I, um, we went to serve. Also, Ryan mentioned this. We went to serve in Uganda. And we serve short term. And I like to say, because it rhymes, that we served and observed. That time was all about observing. And really, that's where I got my call from God to get on board. Chris already had a call to missions. And that's where I got mine. And that was just get on board. This is me working in your husband's life. And that's me. And I'm telling him to go and you go. Get on board. This is what I'm doing. And that was my call. And so it, we did go 
to Lesotho. And we did obey what God was asking us to do. And we did think long. And we were going to be there 10 to 12 years. And we were going to a place uh, among the least reached. There are all these missions terminology and all these things that you have to understand. But we were among the least reached with a team that was going to reach the shepherds who were outcast. And so we were part of that greater team there. Uh, Chris was a dressmaker by vocation. Our open door for the gospel was living in a small village where Chris would teach sewing at a vocational uh, skills training center. And so the whole first year we learned language and culture and he started teaching and he taught one term and then really long story short, but Chris got flu symptoms, flu-like symptoms and, and after being in a coma for three weeks, he died. And what we thought was a long-term commitment was suddenly only 19 months. That's a plot twist that you can't really wrap your head around very well. So this is one, I, I just so appreciate Paul's journey and looking back at it. Because really, all of us should know, when we step out in obedience and we are doing what we've been asked to do, we don't know the outcome. So all along the way, it makes a lot more sense that we're just abiding in Christ, that we're loving him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and no matter where in the world we are, we're loving our neighbor. Guess what? All those countries, those red countries, those people are in San Diego County. Are you loving your neighbor? I'll tell you what, when I start out on my morning walk, I'm convicted every single day. I want to cry because I feel so Bad. Like, I don't know how to love my neighbor. My neighbor is the second largest mosque in California, and I don't know what to do to love them well. How do I love my Muslim neighbors? How do I even know them? I don't know. I don't know yet. Guys, they're here. Start now. Be about the Great Commission now. So after I went... Guess what my next thing was that I had to obey? I had to suffer. And sometimes our obedience leads to suffering. God promises that he brings life from death. That's his promise. And he promises to use suffering. Do you know what some of the world's greatest revivals... Even today was on a meeting with one of our workers who lives in Tunis. And he was telling us about what the Holy Spirit is doing there, how people are coming to faith, how they're being bold and doing outreach in the city. And these kind of revivals come from suffering, guys. And these people, when they come to faith, they it's not just easy, happy, come to our nice church. It's like, sign up and die. God calls us sometimes to suffer for him. And then next, I was in a support role, and that was part of discipling too, those missionary kids, the students who were there, and we were together, part of an important piece of the going and the strategy. And then after that, coming back here, now I'm part of mobilizing another piece that I felt I'm going to be open with you and say that there was a long time I felt shame for only being a mobilizer because I wasn't among the unreached. Guys, please ask yourself this question. Not, am I doing what they're doing? You get me? 
Not am I doing what, I mean, you can name the missionaries because on the tables are Brad Buser or, you know, Michelle Lapp. I mean, whatever the name is, you shouldn't be asking, am I doing what they're doing? You should be asking yourself, am I doing what God has asked me to do? Have I found my part in the Great Commission? Have I found my part? in the body of Christ, and am I obeying what God has asked me to do? Those are the questions we should be asked. That's the question we should be asking ourselves. And then out of that, I mentioned the word transformation. Is my life leaving a wake of transformation behind me? Because when you die, like, what do you want to leave behind? Things? Like, I just had one of my 49-year-old friends die. None of that matters. Nothing you have matters. Like, tangible, your things. Like, but are you leaving a wake of transformation behind you? And I can say that as we left the village, it, was, it didn't go as we planned. But I want to read to you a message in closing. I want to read to you a message from uh, one of our language helpers. His name is Kotalo. Last year when I was, um, I'm, I'm married again. You can read of the details of my story in my upcoming book that went to print today. <laughs> but my husband, Brent, is here with me. And um, being remarried is one of the, is the fulfillment of many of God's promises to me, but it's a very clear picture of joy in the midst of suffering. It doesn't take away the pain. It has given me joy in the midst of it. And so sometimes I still hurt. This is my hurting season right now. Chris died on February 16th, 10 years ago. So I was missing him a couple years ago, and I thought, you know, it'd be so cool if I could write a letter to heaven, or if I could, ooh, can you imagine if you could, like, text heaven, or a call, just a quick call. Like, I'm happily married, I know that Chris is in a way better place, and I, all of that gives me great peace, but I just want to talk to him sometimes and give him an update. So I did that, and I posted it on Facebook. I put it out there. Maybe, I don't know. I'm sure they, absolutely sure they don't read Facebook in heaven, but um, <laughs> absolutely sure. Uh, <laughs> positive. But at least my friend Kotalo in Lesotho is on Facebook. And he read the letter. And he gave me the peace that I didn't I didn't know I, I didn't know that in like where the, where everything was in the village. I ha we haven't been back since we drove away ten years ago. And so he wrote this. And this is what I want to close with, and then I'm, yeah, I'll just remind you. He said this, your faith and your family to God is so amazing. I remember those days visiting your house at Mudamong. As a young man looking for a good example, the faith you have in Christ, the life you sacrificed for the kingdom of God, your love for the people, you did what Jesus would do. We always remember and are praying for your family. Your faith has made us grow and be faithful to God. It's hard, but you and your husband showed us how to trust and serve God no matter what. It's not easy sometimes, but Jesus didn't say it would be. Dying is a gain to live as Christ. Yes, many shepherds are getting saved and being baptized in the name of Jesus. Mudamong people are getting saved too. You did a big job. And I'm sure Chris, his name there was in Bate Tabang. Um, I'm sure it makes 
and Dante de Bong happy. And Jesus never stops saying, well done, my faithful servants. May we get encouraged and persevere till we see Jesus face to face too. Guys, not unlike Paul, we never met our goal. We were only there 19 months. We had barely learned enough of the language to have a conversation before Chris died. And then we left. Do you know, want to know really the main thing and the biggest thing we did while we lived in that village? Because we were barely learning, learning the language. We loved our neighbors. We loved our neighbors. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Number one, know him. You can't obey him if you don't know him. Love your neighbor. You have neighbors from Afghanistan. You have neighbors from Somalia. Those red nations, they're here. And go and make disciples. And if you're not one of the ones that God tells directly to go to the nations, to go elsewhere, which I still highly recommend despite the cost. He's worthy. He's worthy. But if he never tells you to go among the nations, you better be doing it here. Find your part. Find your part in the Great Commission. Grab someone's hand and bring them along with you to heaven. That's what it's all about. Amen.